technique is built on. Uh, seismic Yes, so as I was saying, um, we talk about polarity of seismic data, we talk about time versus depth, uh, some of the limitations we have of seismic data conventional, and we talk about DHIs, ETC. Okay. So, I would like to just jump right in and present you with a seismic section in color display. I guess this is what uh, some of you would meet for the first time if you're involved in a, a, a seismic interpretation exercise, if you're not from the field, from, from that discipline. So what we have here is a seismic section. Um, we're particularly looking at what is called an inline. So um, one of the two orthogonal vertical sections and then what we have here is a, a, basically, this is where people start asking the questions, what are the colors? Right? What are these colors that I'm looking at? And what are on the axes and what have you? So, then I'll start to modify this image. For instance, if I go this way now, you can see that the colors are basically um, seismic waves, right? Traces. These are traces and you can see the amplitudes. I've colored in the amplitudes of the traces. So anything deflecting to the left is in blue. Anything deflecting to the right, I've colored it in black. So obviously then, these bright colors in the middle of the screen are your, where you have very high amplitudes on those seismic traces. Okay, so this is just a new we could say a new way, uh, the older colleagues would say, you know, this is the modern way of seismic interpretation. So I'll take away the, the bitmap here, so the color display, so you can see only the, the traces. So these are the traces, and now I think it's, although now the, 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 the positive amplitude, so the ones deflecting to the right are now in blue, and the, the negative are in red. If I take away even the colors completely, then you can clearly see that these are traces. You know, these are just seismic traces. That is what was displayed as this, this display. And in fact, this is how seismic used to be interpreted, you know, a long time ago, up until probably the last, you know, 20 years when workstation interpretation came along and we had these color displays. This was how seismic sections looked on paper. So there were people doing paper interpretation, you know, on large um, spreads of seismic sections with their color pencils and what have you, okay? I mean, I, I, this is where I have so much respect for the older colleagues that, you know, interpreted seismic like this because sometimes I wonder if even I can see much on, on such a section. So things have gotten a lot easier. So we're back to the, the, the color display. Uh, sorry, the traces, but in blue and red. So this is basically a stack, a stack or an array of seismic traces. But if we highlight a single trace, for instance, like this one, so how did we come about getting this trace? How did we get this? So this is now where we now have to walk backwards and see how this trace emerged, which a stack of it now produced the seismic section I showed on the very first slide. Okay, so we have to now talk about acoustic impedance. So we get back to that seismic trace, but we have to go back to the basics. So AI or acoustic impedance is the product of density and 
P wave velocity, because there is S wave velocity, for instance. So compressional wave velocity. So therefore, AI is given as density times VP. Now, the difference in acoustic impedance between two layers, you know, one on top of the other, two adjacent layers, is the basis of the seismic reflection imaging technique. So if you have an increase in AI from layer one above to layer two below, then in um, seismic interpretation jargon, you could call it a hard kick. If you have a decrease in AI between the two layers, so you're going from a high AI to a low AI, you could call it a soft kick. Now, on, this, on the right side here, you could see an image which I think captures most of the basis of how we could understand how some of the reflectors, some of the subsurface features are going to show on your seismic. But this is only in terms of acoustic impedance. For instance, starting with the water here, the seabed, we are looking at a situation where, let's see if this is working. So we are having a situation where we go from a low acoustic impedance to a high acoustic impedance. So going from water to rock, basically, at the seabed. Now, this is, this, this is a, a very drastic change because water would have a low AI, lower AI than basically any rock because again, AI is density times velocity. So water has both lower density and lower P wave velocity than the seabed, whatever kind of rock it is. So, so this is now a hard kick basically. Now, also the top of a salt maybe is also going to be a hard kick if the salt is especially at, at, at the shallow level here where the 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 rock is not very stiff hence having a very low uh, compressional wave velocity also if you have a shallow gas sand you're going to get a a, a soft kick at the top of it and a hard kick as you exit it because as you're entering into the shallow gas sand you are going from a rock, so a shale. So anywhere we could, we could assume for now that anywhere outside of this, on this diagram, anywhere that is not shaded is a shale, right? Because shales make up more than, you know, 70%, I think, of the subsurface. So, so you're going from a shale here to a sandstone that contains gas. Obviously, the gas in the, in the sandstone would now make the acoustic impedance low because, you know, it will make it, will, it will reduce the velocity of the wave. It will also reduce the bulk density of that formation. And then as you're exiting it, you're now coming from a low AI back out to a high AI, which is the encasing shale. Okay, so this is, you know, this is very important. Carbonate as well, when you come down to this carbonate area, you're going to also have a situation where you, because carbonates are generally stiffer rocks, you're going to go from a shale, which now relative to this carbonate is soft. So you're, you're going to have a hard kick at the top of it, a soft kick at the bottom of it as you're exiting it. A volcanic intrusion as well is going to be basically the opposite of a shallow gas sand. It's going from uh, low AI to high AI, obviously a, a, an igneous rock would have a much higher AI than, than you know, the, the shale uh, that is encasing it. And then when you come out, you get that. Top of the basement, the same thing. So this is the basics, right? If, if you have this figured out, then you can know what to expect once we start looking at the uh, seismic images, the sections. So then we go on to what is now called reflection coefficient, which is what we feed the acoustic impedances into a formula to give us a reflection coefficient series. So it's basically 
if you use the AI of two adjacent layers, you could come up with a reflection coefficient, which is basically a difference over sum kind of equation. You're going from, you're, you're subtracting AI2 minus AI1 all over the sum of them. And obviously AI, as we've explained, is density and P wave velocity. So this is an example, for instance, right? We have a shale at the top, a sand, sandstone at the bottom, and we have each layer has its own values of density and velocity, and you have AI calculated here. So if we put all of that into this equation, this is what we are going to get. Now, the unit does not matter really whether the density is in gram per cm cube or the velocity is in meters per second. As long as this is the calculation you're doing, obviously they would all cancel out here. So you still get the same answer. So if we do AI sand minus AI shale over AI sand plus AI shale, we end up getting this value here, which is the reflection coefficient at that interface. So really seismic is just about detecting the boundaries rather than the layers themselves. So we're looking at the boundaries. What it shows conventionally on a seismic section is the interfaces. Of course, if you do some other kind of interpretation, maybe a, a quantitative interpretation, you could invert and get out the actual layer properties, but conventionally what you see are the boundaries. So, and this is about 12%, 0.12, which is saying basically 12% of the um, energy is reflected. The remaining 88% is transmitted further down. Okay, so this is the convolutional model, which basically is, is the model that we, 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 we assume or we think is controlling the seismic response that we get or the whole seismic um, reflection surveying technique. Okay, which is basically, if we go from the left to the right here, if you have a model of the earth or the earth and you have various lithologies going from some shale here to some maybe gas field, um, sandstone here in red, then to some other, maybe some mal or whatever down here and then back to a shale and then to a water field sandstone and then back to a shale and then to a limestone. Then each of, each of these layers has its own VP, pure velocity and density, which are now combined as we explained to form acoustic impedance. And as you can see, they sort of you know, mimic each other, but they're not really the, the same thing. They sort of track each other. The, that is the, the density and the P wave velocity but obviously they're two independent things. In fact, people think, you know, it's a huge misconception among students and what have you that, you know, a denser material is, uh, would have a higher velocity. It's just a coincidence. In fact, it's the other way around, if anything. But here in the gas sand, for instance, you can see it's low here and low here at the same time. So, which gives this, this very low AI. So at the end of the day, we end up with this AI. And then when we do the calculations for reflection coefficient at the boundaries, we end up with these, with this series where you have minus and plus. So anything on the left is a negative reflection coefficient. Obviously, because when, when you're doing AI of the bottom layer minus AI of the top layer and the bottom layer is having a lower AI, then you're going to get a negative reflection coefficient. The example we did, the bottom layer had a higher AI, which is why we got 0 0.12 is a positive number. So 
So you get some negative, some positive, and then this is what, and then interestingly also here, remember what I said about the limestone being usually a hard kick whenever we encounter it going from a shale because it's a stiffer rock. See, it's higher in P wave velocity, it's higher in density, and then we get a higher value for acoustic impedance. So when you take that um, model, the lithology, which go, gives you the impedance and then gives you the reflection coefficient, we get, and we convolve that, which is where the convolutional model term comes from. We convolve that with what is called a pulse or a wavelet, in, in particular, a, a zero phase wavelet, a symmetrical wavelet, which is what we are doing basically in seismic acquisition when we vibrate, uh, we use a vibrosis to send in uh, uh, a sweep signal, or we use a dynamite where we cannot use a, a, a vibrosis and what have you to send in a, a signal where, where, which gets reflected, which we can now record. Is basically what we are doing. We're sending a wavelet to convolve it with the reflection coefficient of the earth. And then what comes out is the seismic trace. So, but what happens here particularly is you find each one of these numbers here at, at these individual reflections, one to six represents the reflections from these layers, one to six here. So this is for the top of the so this is for the top of the gas sand. This is for the base of the gas sand. And then when you put all of this together, you get something like this. Going into the gas sand on the left, and then coming out on the right. So going in as a soft kick, coming out as a hard kick. And then when you put together all the reflections from all the layers, you get this seismic trace that is here. Of course, here it's called a synthetic because again, this is, we believe so much that this is the model that you know, governs the seismic response that this is what we use to make a synthetic seismic. So we can make our own seismic um, at well locations and what have you as part of the seismic interpretation. Okay, so I think we'll probably answer the question now, how we got that single trace that I explained, I showed earlier. This is how we got it. Of course, this is not how we get it when we do a seismic survey. Like this is not exactly how, you know, they use a vibrosis or a dynamite as I've explained, and they receive the signals from geophones, they do a lot of processing and then it ends up as a seismic section. It stack the traces and what have you, remove noise. You know, it goes through so much processing that sometimes you, you, it's kind of, to me though, I wonder how there's any signal left, you know, after all the processing that it's gone through. But yeah, very elaborate process. So this is how we got it. Now, the elephant in the room is the issue of polarity. So unfortunately, we have one of those issues again here where, you know, I guess it's one of those issues where the, 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 the whole world ca has failed to agree on one convention. So we have what is called the American polarity and the European polarity or what is called uh, more officially uh, the positive standard polarity and the negative standard polarity. In some places you'd hear things like seg reverse and seg normal, seg being the Society of uh, Exploration Geophysicists, which sets all these conventions. But the issue here is that, take this example, we have a low AI upper layer and a high AI lower layer. So, we're going from low to high, so we're getting a hard kick here, right? In the American polarity system, it is a peak. 
on the signal. It is registered as a positive number on, on the tape in, in the field, on the seismic uh, record. In the European system, which you know, does not make a lot of sense to me in terms of this particular example, it is registered as a trough. You know, a hard event should be positive, but somehow it is um, reverse. It is the exact opposite of the European, of the American polarity. In fact, the American, Canadian use the same polarity, I think. And then the European is European, Australian, something like that. So, and this sets the, the, the stage for a lot of confusion until you have uh, fully understood or gotten it down. So, I'll give you one way to check the polarity of your data. So this is the issue, right? Because of these differences, these two um, conventions that are concurrently being used around the world, when you have a data set, you have to check if, you know, check the polarity of your data before you go on interpreting. Because I'm sure you can imagine the, the consequences for not knowing the polarity of your data. Because in, the, in that example where I showed a, here, where I showed a shallow gas sand as a soft kick followed by a hard kick and a volcanic intrusion as a hard kick followed by a soft kick. If you don't know the polarity of your data, you could be interpreting one as the other, right? You could see a shallow gas sand and mistake it for a volcanic intrusion because it is the exact opposite it would appear. So the seismic section really is all very relative. It's about what's above and what's below. So because of that, we have to clear up this, this polarity issue. I guess we can add this to the list of things like I mentioned that the world has failed to agree on, like maybe which side of the road to drive on, left hand drive or right hand drive or, 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 or 110 and 220 volts, um, or even metric and imperial units, you know? So this is another one. I, I, but I think this is the, probably the, the major one you would find in, in uh, anything seismic technology, or the only one probably. So, so if you have a seismic section, and fortunately it is a marine data, then you could use your data set itself to determine the polarity of the data. Because, well, the interface between the sea and the seabed, we know is a hard kick because we're going from water, which has lower density, lower velocity to a rock which has higher density, high velocity, hence higher AI. So because of that, we know that it is a hard kick. So we now check, what does it register as? Is it a peak? If, since it's a hard kick for sure, if it is a peak, then when a hard kick coincides with a peak, that is American. Remember? Here. A hard kick here, peak. So a hard kick, trough. So, and how do you know what a peak is and what a trough is in the, on the color display is you look at your, your color bar. So, so this thing, right? So your legend, you see that the positive numbers are the peaks, the negative numbers are the troughs. So, what color is the seabed here? This is where you know, some might see it as red, some might see it as blue. But um, if we take a closer look, this is blue, right? The seabed reflection is blue. There's a faint red on top of it, and there's another red beneath it, you know? And you may have observed here 
that I said a peak, this is a peak, but there are some little red reflections on either side. These are called side lobes, right? The same thing on this side as well. So this is basically just more of a side lobe of this blue reflection uh, that is showing, but really it is, a, it is blue. So since the seabed is always, always a hard kick, and here it is presented as a trough because it's a negative number, then obviously this is European polarity data, okay? So the one I don't like is this one, which means now if you're looking for a shallow gas sand, which is the top of it should be soft, bottom of it should be hard, you are going to look for, instead of the intuitive one, I almost sound like I am campaigning for one of the, the, uh, the conventions here, but I just can't help it. One is more, more intuitive to me. Instead of the intuitive one where soft would now be uh, trough, hard would now be peak, you're looking for the opposite, okay? So, and then if you don't have what happens if you don't have a marine data? It's no seabed. When you take your data from land, you're basically, there's no, there isn't that uh, interface that you are sure of, okay? So then maybe, because really you can't, if you attempted to interpret a seismic section, a seismic data set with, um, the seismic alone, you know, you, have, you, have, you can only do so much, but wells go a long way and a well would help you to almost certainly determine the polarity of your data. It's not a finite, it's not an infinite uh, number of options, it's either or. or. Or maybe, you know, if you knew that you are in a basin that has some limestone or something, then obviously, if you know where to expect the limestone, you check the top of it because the limestone would almost certainly be a hard kick and then you, you, you would determine it from there. Or simply just ask the, the processor, you know, from the processing, they will tell you what polarity the data is. But generally, we uh, seem to observe, that, uh, to observe that data coming from uh, the Gulf of Mexico, or somewhere in the US, usually comes with uh, American polarity. And data from Europe, so like the North Sea, would come in a European polarity. But obviously, you can't just depend on that. Um, if you get some data from I don't know, China or somewhere. And, you know, you have to, it could be either. So that is that about polarity. Um, we will probably take a few, a few, we'll take some, some, you know, new people to seismic interpretation a while to, to really wrap their heads around this polarity issue. Okay, so the next thing that we're discussing is an issue of time versus depth, okay? Because I have not even explained what these are, right? The axis. So this is what I would say is a, is a bad graph if, if you don't, if you have not labeled your axis. Well, it's deliberate anyways. So obviously this is a three-dimensional seismic data set um, for anyone that is familiar with it because this is inline cross line, right? So like I said, they are orthogonal to each other. So um, if you have the inlines 2680, 
But as you go along, it doesn't change. So which means we are on the inline, right? But as you go along, the cross line XL changes, right? So we get 500 here, 550 here, 600 here, 649. So it means that at this um, marker here, there's cross line 550 going, you know, perpendicular to this inline. The same as, you know, it goes like that. But on the depth axis, which is what concerns us at this point, is a time axis. Sorry, on the, on the vertical axis is a time axis because seismic is recorded in time, not in depth, because it's a seismic wave. Right? You send it down, you record how long it took the wave to reflect from a certain um, interface or a certain boundary. And you record it as two-way time. So time to go down and come back up, right? And it is in milliseconds, so a thousandth of a second, okay? So, and this is where this throws up another problem because basically every other data we have in subsurface is in depth, okay? The wells are in depth, everything is in depth. So and we have this seismic in time and we need to sort of um, correlate these data so we are faced with the issue of time versus depth, okay? Now, of course, since we're talking of time and depth, it's, it's, at this point, it probably sounds a bit, uh, it sounds straightforward that, well, there is a way we can go from time to depth and depth to time, really. It's, it's just velocity, right? Well, it's simple and not so simple at the same time, okay? Because for instance, we can actually tell the depth of this seabed from the surface. So this zero, so where you don't have, where the gray starts is the surface, your mean sea level, surface of the sea. And then the seabed is here marked by the blue reflector. So obviously, we're now saying the depth from, so the depth of the seabed, right, is, or the water depth, as it's called, is about 400 and, I don't know, if this is 300, it's probably 500, so let's say 410, I don't know, 420, whatever. So let's say it's 420. Right. One thing you learn coming from engineering to geoscience is that it is not important to be precise in geoscience. Just have an idea. It should be roughly around, you know, no geoscientist want to, wants to know whether the thickness of a sandstone bed is 250 meters or 250.5, really, you know. So it's okay to sort of approximate. So engineers would have to switch off that part of their brains when they're doing, or when they're involved in this kind of, of workflows. So if you're going from zero to 420, right? Since, so I said what, what relates time and depth is velocity, right? So velocity is distance over time, right? So if we're looking for distance, we multiply time and velocity. Now, before we forget, this time here is two-way time, right? 
and it's in milliseconds. So, so that's 420 over 1000. So that's the millisecond part taken care of. And we also divide it by two. So 420 over 2000, okay? Times velocity. So we're going all metric here. Now the velocity of um, seawater or water should be around 1,500 meters per second, right? Um, so we go one five, right? So we end up with about 21 here over 100. So we end up with 21 times 15. So we end up with about 300 and what? Five. So meters, right? So we're now basically saying this is 315 meters. And in fact, well, I've not mentioned where this data set is from, but this is, this is the troll field in uh, the Norwegian North Sea, it's a gas field. And you would hear that it has a seabed or water depth of 300 to 330 meters okay so we're somewhere in the middle here obviously as we're going down on this right side it's probably going further towards 330 and then there are other places that are uh, shallower okay so this is how you get your time to depth conversion only for the depth to seabed we can't quite do that for the rest of the um, subsurface okay why because while the velocity of sound in water is constant once you get into the rocks you're encountering a variety of sediments a variety of rock types you have shales you have sandstones you have shales with of different types of different compactions and what have you so you end up having a velocity that is not constant so you can't really do this simple calculation to come up with what the distance is then it becomes an elaborate calculation but it's more or less still the same thing relating it to velocity to get out the distance okay but generally Another thing is that velocity generally increases with depth, obviously, because of the increasing compaction with depth, which increases the stiffness of the rock. Okay? And of course, velocity is a function of stiffness and not density. And stiffness is um, elastic modulus. Okay? So this is, this is what we end up with, 350 meters. Okay? Now, for all the size, for all the, the 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 accolades and all the 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 features of seismic data, 3D seismic especially, which is you know it's, it's the closest thing we have to seeing into the subsurface, like looking into the subsurface, imaging it. You know, um, it was a game changer when it came around, reduced dry holes significantly. Um, so for all the benefits it, it brings, it is, it is not a silver bullet. It is not, for instance, it is not all seeing, right? Even though it's the best, the closest thing you have to seeing because it is a geophysical technique. The issue with geophysical techniques is that they are indirect measurements, right? We are hardly ever measuring the exact thing we're looking for whenever we're using a geophysical technique. We're always measuring 
some proxy of what we are looking for, and then we have to kind of uh, process or interpret it into what we are looking for. Specifically, as I've explained, that of seismic is an issue of acoustic impedance, the contrast in acoustic impedance. So it means when there is no contrast in acoustic impedance, right, or very little con contrast, even if the, the two layers are different types, you would not, the seismic would not see it, right? Because, you know, the seismic can basically be fooled because we are sending it down there to tell us where there is sand and where there is shale. And we have a sand and a shale stacked, but it can't tell the difference because it is not really looking at where there is sand and where there is shale per se. It is looking, it is detecting them by AI contrast. Okay, of course run through to the back. In this calculation, if the AIs are the same, if this is also 4320 or 43, whatever, you know, something very close or the same, then you can see how in this calculation, this ends up as a zero or close to zero, okay? And if the reflection coefficient is zero or close to zero, then you won't get a reflection. In fact, as you can see here, there's a tiny bit of negative reflection coefficient coming out of this um, white to this shale. And the reflection of it is almost hard to see. You know, it's a very weak reflection. Okay, so that is what happens. So it is susceptible to the same um, uh, fallibility, if you like, of seismic, of um, geophysical techniques. You know, you send a gamma ray log down to tell you where there is shale and where there is sandstone. And a gamma ray log is basically, instead of, it's not looking at the rocks and knowing what is shale and what is sandstone, right? You, you, if you go out to, on an outcrop and you find where a, 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 an outcrop where there is a shale and a sandstone, you know, and you can basically tell just, you know, with your eyes that this is a shale, this is a sandstone, this is the contact between them, you know, but because we're not, we're, we're blind in the subsurface, so to speak, we send these tools and we ask the gamma ray log to tell us, but what the gamma ray log is really doing is checking for radioactivity, right? It's looking for K40, potassium 40, which is in shale, which is radioactive. Which means that if you find a sandstone next to a shale and the sandstone happens to, find, happens to have some radioactive elements in it, maybe uranium or thorium, then the conventional gamma ray log would not see the sandstone. It would see shale and shale, right? I'm hearing there is no audio. Is there no audio? Surely there is. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm carrying now. So, um, that is the issue, right? With, with that is one of the issues that you can have with seismic data. Same thing you can have with, like I said, all the other geophysical tools, okay? Um, then there's an issue of resolution. Okay, how much, how thick, or how, how much distance um, 
or how thick do things need to be for seismic to resolve them, right? So there's a general convention that anything that is smaller than, if the, if the, if the top and base of a bed, if the top and base of a bed are less than quarter of a wavelength apart, then seismic would not be able to see those two events as separate because there will be tuning or interference between the reflection from the top and the reflection from the base, right? So where you have thin beds, then you find it difficult to determine their thicknesses accurately from seismic. And then there's even an issue of detection. If a feature, a bed, or a layer, whatever it is, is less than 1 30th of the wavelength of the dominant frequency of the seismic signal, then the seismic will not even see it, right? It would go past, past it. So I'm saying wavelength. So this equation of a wave, B equals to F lambda, if you remember, is basically tells you that the frequency or the wavelength, right, is inversely proportional to the frequency. So for an example, let's say we have a, so the V here, we're talking about the velocity of the rock because Again, maybe for the students here, um, what have you, velocity is a property, velocity of sound is a property of the medium rather than that of the sound, right? So let's say a typical rock that has a 3,000 meters per second velocity, right? And a typical dominant frequency of, let's say, 50 hertz, right, and 50 hertz is cycles per second, right? So you end up with 60, right, meters as the wavelength of your, your seismic wave. So in terms of resolution, if we have a bed, a sandstone layer that is about, you know, anything less than 15 meters, then it would, there would be tuning effects between, the, let's say, the troughs here and the peaks here. Okay? The side lobes of these peaks here would get to a point that they are adding to the, amplifying the size of these troughs here. And, you know, you can't really resolve what is what. Or in the case of detection here, if you have, in this same case of 60 meters, if you have um, anything less than two meters, for instance, in this example, then the seismic won't see it at all, right, conventionally. So we have higher resolution seismic, you know, where basically it's an issue of frequency. Because you look at this equation here, you, see, you realize, well, the only thing you can change to change the wavelength, which governs this resolution and detection, is the frequency. The velocity of a medium is constant. So when you have a higher frequency um, seismic signal, you can get uh, finer resolutions, okay? But then that is still a limitation of the physics if you send in very high frequencies from the surface and you're trying to get to 13,000 feet, then inevitably only the lower frequencies will get there because higher frequencies are attenuated faster than low frequencies, lower frequencies, okay? Yeah, so this was the example. This, this, this will capture the example I was given, right? With your eyes, you can basically clearly see that this is a sandstone right? And these are shales in between, you know, this is another sandstone, another thin strip of sandstone, right? And probably at the base here, you see the rest of it. Uh, so there's this line here, 
you know. So these these thin strips of sandstone in between here, seismic has no idea what is happening, right? Because I mean, from this guy's height, you could tell that this is probably, you know, this this is probably less than half a meter. It's not even close to two meters in this example that I gave earlier. So it would not know what is happening. And there are clearly shales in between here. And, you know, these shales, depending on how laterally extensive they are, let's say this is a reservoir, and, and, and perhaps this shale goes all the way across. It could have implications for reservoir connectivity, right? Flow in the, in the vertical axis, permeability, okay? So they will form sort of flow barriers. But your seismic will not tell you, you know, only a well test and what have you will tell you that, you know, there's something here. Your seismic will probably show this as a large sandstone that's completely missed these thin beds of low permeability shells in between. And then, you know, you have unexpected problems, okay? So, Again, the same thing I said about the, the gamma ray log earlier. So how are we doing with time? Let me check. Okay, wow, I've been talking for quite a while. Yeah, I guess I could take a pause here. I don't know if that's part of the plan, but this is where we move on to the um, sort of second phase, if you like, of the presentation. Um, so I, I, I would like to take him maybe two minutes water break uh, before we carry on with direct hydrocarbon indicators. Okay. So use my mic. I hope. Um, People that are having questions are jotting them down because I'll try, I'll try and finish in the next 10 minutes so that we will have room for questions for today. And I hope my pace has been okay. Okay, so let's carry on. Um, so we have what are called direct hydrocarbon indicators, right? So like I said, this is a basic seismic cost, really. We're not going into, you know, structural interpretation and what have you and stratigraphic and, you know, more advanced um, interpretation techniques. We're just looking at some basics. So DHIs, you know, used to be one of the, uh, the, the, you know, quick ways to detect hydrocarbon accumulations from seismic images, right? Um, DHIs include what we call the bright spot, the flat spot, the dim spot, and the polarity reversal. Um, so we'll take one, okay? So remember this guy from from the first slide, right? It's actually a bright spot, okay? I think it's um, self-explanatory in terms of it being called a bright spot. 
you see how the reflections sort of brighten and then they dim out at the end. And then the same thing at the top and base, okay? So this is a typical bright spot from the same data sets that I've, I've been working on earlier. So since we know what our polarity is, right? Remember we said this was European polarity. So it's the other way around. So, so a positive number, a peak, instead of representing a hard kick, so an increase in AI, is here representing a soft kick, a decrease. So this is a decrease in acoustic impedance at the top, a soft kick, so something going like this, right? And then the bottom is now a peak, right? Uh, the bottom is a trough, so it's an increase, right? So we're going like this, okay? So in fact, this is a gas sand as interpreted, right? This is a shallow gas accumulation because it is a low acoustic impedance layer because of the gas encased in higher, I would call it higher acoustic impedance shale. So shale above, shale below, gas sand in between. So we we'll guess if I remove it, you this is what 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 it it comes out as. Okay. We're having the wave going soft kick into the gas, hard kick as it comes out of the gas accumulation. So this really is just a bright spot um, due to gas. And remember, if we did not know our polarity, right? If we thought this was American, then this is a hard kick going in, a soft kick coming out. We could just say this is some igneous intrusion and we move right ahead. We'd have missed a gas accumulation. Not that shallow gas accumulations are even used as a, um, are even developed as reservoirs. I know of only one example. But, <clears throat> It could be costly, right? If you think this is igneous or, uh, or something and perhaps your well trajectory was supposed to pass through it and you pass through it and it, it's shallow enough to pose a shallow gas uh, drilling risk hazard, then you, know, you could have an issue. If you don't have your surface casing at that point with your BOP on top, then you know, you could run into a kick and possibly an, a blowout. So this is how a, a, a bright spot and a flat spot might appear, okay? Shale out here, right? Gas sand in here. So we go soft. So, so we go, we get a trough. On this example, I am using a, pol a an American polarity, okay? So we go trough, and then we're, as we're coming out from gas sand, GS gas sand, into, back into the shale, we get a peak. So this is what happens. Soft kick, hard kick. And then this is what makes it a bright spot. You see, the reflections here are sort of intermediate in amplitude, in brightness, and then they brighten out here, right? Same thing here. They are, they are not that much, and then they brighten out. So this is how you get a bright spot, okay? And then, uh -huh. and then this is how you get a flat spot, okay? where you have, but the flat spot is not usually as bright as a bright spot because you're now going from a gas sand, which is sort of intermediate, you know, low to a water sand, which is intermediate. So if I had an axis here for AI, right? So 
let's say here is shale having the highest ai here is water sand having the medium ai and here is gas sand having the uh, lowest ai then we go from shale to gas sand so we're having a drop that is this much right so the the size of the drop will determine the size of the the the, the amplitude anomaly the bright spot then if we're going from gas sand here to water sand we're going this way so you see it, it's an increase but it's not that much compared to shale to um, gas sand so that is why the flat spot is of a lower um, brightness and it's usually opposite the opposite from what the um, top of the bright spot is because this is going this way is a soft kick and the flat spot is a hard kick so you see this is red and is a trough and then here is blue and is a is a peak okay so this is an example because we have an example that shows both the hard kick uh, the gas sand and sorry the flat spot and the the um, bright spot and this is the example which is the field i the same data set i've been using as examples so we have the troll field in norway as uh, second largest gas field in europe discovered in 79 started production in 95 originally estimated to hold about 46 tcf of recoverable gas holds about 40 percent of norway's total proven gas reserves in fact, it produced 1.3 trillion cubic feet of gas in 2017. Okay, and ex expected to stay till 2060. Now, this is one of the very iconic um, DHI cases published, and from it's from that same field. Now, you would see basically a bright spot top of the reservoir so i have to mark it i have to use a different color here now because uh see Into options so maybe something yellow it's here right you see the top of the reservoir it's that blue reflection going across on top of it now troll is on european polarity right so a soft kick is a peak rather than a trough and that's why the the blue here is a peak as you can see it here right it's plus here and then what i think what is more prominent is actually the flat spot see it here in red so obviously like i said the flat spot is the opposite color to the bright spot so you see it here in yellow uh, in red it's going across the field in fact how we know that is a bright spot because uh, a flat spot uh, if you look at the reflectors are sort of dipping right everything is sort of kind of dipping there are faults going through is this is a fault this is a fault and everything and then we have this reflection that is going across horizontally now one thing we know about fluid contacts is that they are horizontal you know mostly horizontal under normal circumstances right regardless of the shape of the container the fluid contact is going to be horizontal so this is how they were even, you know, that's how we, need, we, we, we got to know that these are fluid contacts. Because you find a dipping bed, everything is dipping, 
and then you have this one reflection going straight across horizontally, right? And then it meets even the top of the, let me I scribbled too much on this, uh, on this, oh, I've seen erase all ink. So you look at it, it's going straight across. And then it's meeting even the top of the reservoir, right? So this is your flat spot and a bright spot in the same field. And how long is the flat spot? Seven kilometers. Seven whole kilometers. You know, this is a big field, okay? And it's around 1,700 meters per second. This is 1,500, this is 2,800. So, so yeah, so it's, it's right around here, 1700, okay? All right. And in fact, how big is the field? I, I, I always think nothing gives you an, a picture of the size of this field, like the platform. This is trawl A. I introduce you to the tallest structure in the world to have ever been moved to another position, period, right? <laughs> Um, so it's a con deep, you know, concrete deep water structure, permanent structure. And it's been there since uh, 95, I think. And then, you know, like I mentioned, it's going to be there for till 2060. Okay. Because of the size of the gas that, you know, that, that, that is discovered under that it's it, it's gone from 50% to 40% of Norway's gas. You know, this is quite uh, an engineering. I'm sure when they discovered the field from the seismic at the beginning and they looked at all these, you know, obviously that influences the kind of decisions you make for field development. And, you know, they knew they were going to be producing gas from this field for a good 60, 70 years. So it was a worthwhile um, decision, investment to do, okay? So yeah, this is the, so this sits on top of this field, okay? Gas here, so the fluid contact is gas to water, okay? There's oil in other parts of the field. Uh, in fact, in the, in the, 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 what is called the troll West, where there is oil and gas, and then the trawl east, which is this one, is oil bearing. So I think I'll probably stop here and allow time for some questions and answers. And uh, yeah, I guess this is where I'd like to stop for today. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Engineer Booker. That, that was a very good um, and insightful lecture. Uh, questions? I haven't seen any questions on the... Apan, have you seen any questions? No, no questions now. No questions. I've not seen any questions. Okay, I will just... I guess I'll just uh, uh, go over a few things. Just do a little recap and um, just so we can be, uh, yeah. So yes, um, so I, I, I guess we've answered this question, right? Now, uh, uh, this is the trace that became this image that we started with. Um, starting with a single trace and then a stack of traces and then we end up in a color display. They've made it quite, quite easy for us, I guess, um, today with this color display and you can do so much more to, to bring out more features. Um, 
let me see where where is it that i think i have not done any i'm not i've, I've rushed it a bit i don't think i can see anywhere okay maybe let's see what's on the other side of that slide that i stopped on oh yeah there was one more slide on troll uh, I mean, you can tell that I like this platform because I keep showing images of it. This is, gives you an idea of the size of it. Um, standing over 400 meters. This is the Eiffel Tower. This is the Empire State Building. And then this is Troll A right next to them. So it is, it is quite huge. Um, even without this flare boom, it will still be the tallest, taller of tallest of the three. Okay. Yeah, and then we have another one from off, offshore Nigeria, but I, I guess we'll probably just start looking at this one and see how far we can go. But this is probably for me the best example I have seen of a um, fluid contacts and, you know, direct hydrocarbon indicators, basically. Best example of DHIs I've, I've seen. Um, because what we have here is usually we get a gas water contact, right? Or a gas oil contact. Because the difference in density and uh, velocity between a gas and a, a gas bearing sand and a gas, uh, an oil bearing sand or a water bearing sand is significant, right? Of course, it's the highest when we have a gas bearing sand and a water bearing sand, the gap is the highest. But because the densities of um, oil and water are not, you know, as, what's it called? It's not as large as the density difference between gas and water or gas and oil, then we hardly see oil water contacts, right? Um, so, but then I guess there's a lot of things going on for this seismic section that make, made this possible. Um, our oil is lighter, so hence there is a bigger difference than usual between the oil and the water. And, um, and the reservoir is younger, which makes these fluid effects to come out more. Okay? So, at the, the first arrow here, we have uh, I need to change my pointer to red. The first arrow we have, we have a gas oil contact here, right? No, red is, is a bad color. We have a gas oil contact here, the first contact, first arrow, and then at the second arrow we have an oil water contact, right? So, we have a bright spot even at the top of the gas here. Uh, so let's see, purple or green? Green. So we have a bright spot. So this is the gas leg. There's a bright spot, this yellow. And as you can see, once we, as you go down this tilted, so it's a tilted fault block. So you go down this tilted fault block, you see that the, the bright spot sort of dims out the moment you get past the, the oil water contact, uh, the gas oil contact, because it's now going from, it was going from shale to gas bearing sand, which is a very high um, contrast in AI, to now shale to oil bearing sand, which is lower. So it sort of dims out, right? And then inside this fault block here, we now have fluid contact here 
and fluid contact here. And then there's another reservoir or another sort of unit next to it in between here, right? That this bright spot that I just drew on is due to oil, not due to gas, because all the gas is above it. It's due to oil. So we're going here from oil, from shale. So there's a shale in between them, right? Then from a shale to an oil bearing sand. And then the, the oil water contact for the two chambers is all together. It's all across. See? In fact, this is what suggests to you that these reserve, these uh, cham these uh, units are in communication, making it a um, uh, they have hydraulic communication between them, right? Because the fluid levels are the same, the fluid contact, okay? So, and you see, the seismic does not tell us where they kind of met because there's clearly a shale in between these two fault blocks on this whole fault block. And then there is, because the seismic cannot see small things, perhaps it's a very small uh, bed or unit that sort of makes the hydraulic communication possible, but seismic cannot see it. But because we have a very uniform oil water contact going right across the first onto the shale to the next sand, then we su it suggests, I mean, it could be a coincidence, but it suggests that we have a, the two units are in hydraulic communication and we have one full uh, fluid contact here and one, one reservoir. You know, if you, if you just determine what's one reservoir or two reservoirs by the hydro, uh, hydraulic communication or lack thereof between them, then this is one reservoir. And then this, this, this is what we'll now give, um, which is for tomorrow's lecture, hopefully, which I, I guess since we've covered a lot, is going to be short, maybe an hour only. Um, this is now what, where, where geoscientists will get this very interesting shape of the reservoir and pass it on to reservoir engineer, who wonders why, you know, uh, what resulted in this kind of shape. Reservoir engineers would kind of uh, prefer shapes that are not too complicated because there's a lot of flow modeling to be done and, and what have you. Okay. Simulation. Okay. So yes, uh, this, is, this, is, this is certainly the best I've seen. Both fluid contacts showing. I don't know what field this is, but uh, it's called Sea of Mobile. And it's quite, it's fairly old, okay? So I guess uh, I'll stop here. Um, since there have been no questions, this is the end of today's session. Hopefully for tomorrow, it'll just be a short session on how to, how to, how some of these reservoirs are mapped and we come up with some of these shapes, which hopefully the, the reservoir engineer would, if he has an appreciation of how this is being done, or the petroleum engineer generally, then would, would understand that you know, the, ge the geoscientist didn't just make his life difficult by giving him a very complicated shape of a reservoir to model and simulate, but it's just what the geology gave out. I was following the, the reflectors, okay. So I think I would like to end this presentation here. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Hand over to the moderator. Yeah, thank you very much, Engineer Booker, for a very wonderful presentation. And we're looking forward to tomorrow's. Um, I would like to call on our section director, engineer Eri Iyala, to give a closing remark, please. Mm.
Mr. Eri, are you still here? Can you hear us? Okay, probably having some network issues because he's very much on the platform. Okay, thank you so much. I think maybe we'll, we'll bring this to a close now. Looking forward to having you tomorrow at 11 a.m. for another wonderful presentation by Engineer Booker. Engineer Booker, thank you very much. This was a very good presentation. See you all tomorrow. You can drop your questions and your emails on the chat in the chat room, please. And save some of your questions for tomorrow. We'll take we'll have more time to take questions tomorrow. So you can go maybe prepare your mind, prepare your questions. I have a lot of questions I'm going to ask definitely. Engineer Booker, from the comments I'm seeing, it seems people enjoyed your, your lectures and they're asking if they could have the presentation, the, um, the slides. Hello, yeah, of course I can make it available, but you know, after tomorrow's session, since yeah. I'm, not, okay. I'm not done with the presentation, yeah. Okay, okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm. Okay, I guess um, we can bring this to a close now. Thank you very much. This made a lot of sense. Even before, before this lecture, I've always wondered what all these seismics were all about. <laughs> I think I'm beginning to see what some of the things I see mean. <laughs>